thing right here. Manual transmission class, we're doing clutch service. Now, well, my slides don't usually have a lot of worries on them. In this case, there's going to be a few clutch service. The year and model of the vehicle, everything's got to be that way. And some procedures are common to all of them. Now, how many of you have heard, have heard of the new transmissions that uh, don't require you to do anything except put it in gear and drive? I'm talking about transmissions with manual gears in them that actually, there are gears like these that you see over here, but they actually have shift forks and all this kind of stuff, but it's totally automatic. Is that the manumatic, the dog box? Yeah. Huh? Dog box? Yeah, the ones that, uh, the Ford's got them. And uh, it's got a number designation, you know, that you'll have to figure out whether. But while I'm short of it, it's got, those have got two input shafts, they've got two clutches, it's totally automatic. They have sound characteristics like regular manual transmissions, and some customers are confused by that. But the long and the short of it is, uh, they shift, everything is done automatically, and all you have to do is just put your foot on there. Now, Volkswagen years ago, the old bugs used to have a stick shift automatic. And when you put your hand on the gear shifter, it would off-center that little spring-loaded thing and make a ground that would cause a little vacuum diaphragm to release a clutch. But it had a clutch and a torque converter. It was really weird. And it just had one pedal in the floor instead of a clutch and a brake. Those are strange. Anyway, basically what we're going to talk about here, you got a hydraulic system. Yeah. You didn't have a manual transmission there? That's one of those weird things where everybody has everything. Did you have an extra one? That's where his went. I wondered about all this. Okay. All right. So anyway, now if the, the on the little escort that we have out here, the little escort we've got out there, that little older ninety, early nineties escort, doesn't have a. It's got a hydraulic clutch, but it doesn't have a clutch master cylinder reservoir. It gets fluid from the brake master cylinder reservoir. Just borrows some of that, which That's is scary. Isn't that interesting? All right, so well, if you can't stop, you don't need to be going. Quick, think about it. <laughs> All right, leaks at the Details. master cylinder. If the master cylinder, I'm talking, when we're talking master cylinder, we're talking clutch master cylinder, not brake master cylinder. Oh, it works in a similar fashion. It's a lot of, it's often at the clutch pedal rod seal, and that can be seen by looking for leaks where the clutch pedal rod goes in there. Leaks at the slave cylinder, which is the part that goes, and they got concentric slave cylinders that are inside the bell housing that go right there that the, uh, Throw out bearings built onto them, yeah. but I like I like the ones that are outside the bell housing and just actually move the lever that applies the clutch because you can replace those really easily. And bleeding some of these uh, masters, the clutch slave cylinders, but bleeding the air out is really tough because it's down low and the cylinders up high. And on some of the Chevrolets, you've actually got to take the stupid thing off and hold it up in the air <laughs> and do crazy thing. Uh, distorted or damaged hydraulic lines or hoses, you got to look at all that kind of stuff. We'll whip through this pretty quick. Air trapped in the hydraulic line can cause the clutch not to disengage completely. And what I mean not disengage completely, <coughs> I mean when you mash the clutch, it may not completely release and you'll have a grind in trying to put it in gear. You know, and you won't feel anything. Now, uh, the other way, if the clutch is too tight for some reason or another, and it ha that happens whenever you wind up with it wearing, uh, like uh, Eric, the guy that had this uh, uh, Dodge Stealth that he bought for four or five hundred dollars that somebody had that had jumped time and bent valves and he fixed the engine and all that kind of stuff but when he was driving it it was like the clutch wouldn't release all the way it was partially engaged so we actually on that one we, I went under there and I looked and it had a little uh, clevis under there with a threaded rod and a nut and I actually took that clevis loose where the uh, pedal I tried, I went to the master door and I adjusted that and made him have a good clutch so he's basically had some wear on his clutch disc because if the clutch disc gets thinner then basically when I'm talking about a clutch, some of you guys don't have a clue. That's what we're talking about here. This is the clutch disc, and this is the pressure plate. You got that? Now, this, this pressure plate, whenever you're putting it together, you notice this one here still got some life left in it. These lines are still on it. They're not worn out. You don't have actually, they're, they're not worn down to the rivets, and not all of them have rivets. But this pressure plate right here, you're supposed to replace these in pairs. Now, if you go to the dealership, sometimes they'll sell you just this. Like I've, I've actually bought one of these for an Explorer, just the disc, a rebuilt one. But it also had, it needs to spin true, you know, and it's because if it's, if it's spinning like with lateral run out, it won't totally release because it'll always be touching. But this bolts to the flywheel and this is trapped between them. And when you mash this thing, that diaphragm spring is going to cause this heavy part of this to release this clutch and the, the input shaft on the transmission goes on the splines. Okay, you see this spring pack? 
Look, this is important. All right. See that? See that spring pack? You can put this on backwards, and it's gonna, if you do, it's going to cause you trouble. Always remember that that spring pack goes toward the pressure plate. You got me? Now, if you'll look, you'll see on the clutch disc where it'll say flywheel side. That one actually says that. Some of them's got it stamped into the metal. Anyway, there that is. I don't really see any point in passing that around because it's too heavy to handle sitting at your disc. All right. So, anyway, this right here, there's your concentric slave cylinder like I was talking about with your little bleeder coming out. So you got your, this is a little graphic, you know, that I borrowed. It's got a little piston in there, and it's pushing air through here. See that air, air bubbles? You squeeze in those air bubbles, you're not going to move the clutch as far as you need to move it. All right, you got to squeeze that air. It's going to prevent it from doing its job. All right, the most effective method for bleeding clutch hydraulic system is to vacuum bleed the system. Yep. Some of them have no bleeder screw in the slave cylinder. The hydraulic systems require a special bleeding procedure, but you got to look at your workshop manual to see what it is. And sometimes the single most irritating thing to do in some cases is bleeding that slave cylinder because it can be a real pain. On some of the forwards, they've got the square hole where the uh, the fork used to go through there, and I've actually bled them backwards. I'd go up in there with my big pry bar and I'd put it against that slave cylinder and I would pump it, you know, and bleed them that way. And it, it's really a pain trying to do all of that. Something else you need to pay attention to the little pilot bushing on the front wheel drive vehicles, you don't typically have a pilot bushing, you know, some of them do. But the little pilot bushing where the input shaft goes in, and up here I used to have, oh, here we go. See this here? This is an input shaft, and ordinarily there's a gear on the end of this, but this input shaft, right there's a pallet, bush, or pallet bushing or bearing, usually it'll be a bearing nowadays. If that pallet bearing is actually worn out or not, uh, real, you know, letting this spin freely, this, uh, the engine's turning here and it'll keep trying to turn the transmission, see, so that you can't, I mean, you can't get it in gear. It'll clash even though the clutch is totally released. If anything is interfering and turning this, so that pilot bearing or that pilot bushing always needs to be replaced. There's special tools to get them out of there. Uh, this one right here, see ordinarily if it worked, this is what would go in here. See that? But these splines are different because it's a different clip. That's what that is all about. Okay. You got to connect the vacuum hose from the bleeder to the bleeder fitting. Bleed the fluid from the system while no air bubbles appear in the fluid. Use only high performance dot three motor vehicle brake fluid. Clutch service inspection, you're going to look for disc runout. What is disc runout? Lateral runouts when the disc is doing this. I'm not worried about radial runout because that's not doing me anything. Lateral runout, if that thing, now what causes them to wind up having lateral runout? How many, how many of you guys have ever put a, man, a manual transmission back in something? You done that? Okay, so what you're doing is you fool around with it and you're trying to get it to stab in there and you're fighting with it, you're fighting with it, maybe the splines are buttoning and all this kind of stuff. And you say, well, I'm just sick of this. I'm going to get some long bolts and I'm going to pull this thing in. You're not supposed to do that. And not supposed to do that because what happens when you do that is you distort this darn thing and this is supposed to be perpendicular to that. And now, because you've pushed it and forced it and maybe it finally jumped and went through, now this is crooked. And now this is always laying in there a little bit crooked and it's always either dragging on the flywheel and the pressure plate and it's turning the transmission and you can't rrr, 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 you got gear clutch. Yeah. It's terrible to do something like that. Isn't that why you have that alignment tool? The alignment tool, yes, but sometimes whenever you're fighting with it, you're still... I've actually had to do it without an alignment tool and just eyeball that sucker. You know, worked it around where it looks really good in the middle and but I've got a universal alignment tool too. So, you know, if we ever have to have that, we've got it. We've got it. Uh, anyway, friction material depth, that's the depth of this friction material that you see on here. If you see that it's worn, this one here still looks pretty good, it's fairly serviceable, it could be used. I don't even remember where that one came from. Oil or grease saturation on that lining, worn or loose friction material, broken dampening springs. What's a dampening spring? The dampening spring is these springs here, right here, these springs right here because these are basically two different parts there, and as it grabs, this spring goes boing. If you didn't have that, it would go pop. It would just bust something. The dampening spring enables it to take a shock whenever you let off on it. Uh, worn or rusted clutch hub splines, which is what's in the center of that thing. Okay, there's your clutch disc runout test. Now, not everybody has one of those, but what I do is I take and I have the transmission sitting on the floor. I slide that clutch disc on that input shaft, and I turn it through with a dial indicator hooked to it, 
And we had one that one time that had uh, 80 thousandths run out. You couldn't see it with your naked eye, but you could see it with a dial indicator. And we worked on that darn thing for a week trying to get it to where it would go in gear without grinding. And it turned out the clutch disc was had run out. All right, friction material depth is right there. You notice the rivet and the lining. You know, when you're looking at the release bearing, look for smooth rotation of the bearing. The release bearing is actually what rides against these fingers right here. See that? Now, on the older ones, they didn't want the release bearing always touching those, but on the newer ones, they do. So I don't know what the difference was in the way the bearings made. But anyway, damaged clutch fork, which is that what moves the release bearing if it's got a fork, grooves on the clutch sleeve of the transmission. The actual uh, release bearing rides on a sleeve on the front of the transmission, and if it's worn or bumpy or, you know, it's got some uh, wear on it because of the spinning uh, bearing on it, you got to replace that sleeve so that it'll work smoothly. Uh, you can look at grooves on the fingers at contact release bearing, what I just showed you a minute ago, bent release bearing fingers. You can look at this most of the time and tell. Pivot ball retaining spring is actually in the bell housing. As a matter of fact, I can probably show you that right here. Pivot ball retaining spring. See this right here? See that fork? All right, there's a ball in there. There's a retaining spring that holds that on that ball. That's what that's talking about. There's your fork. There's the input shaft for this transmission. <coughs> Incidentally, you guys are always going to have to give me power flow. You're going to have to give me power flow on the front wheel drive transmission and on the rear wheel drive transmission, and that's going to be part of your final exam. I'm going to set this thing on the table. I'm going to say, I want you to tell me how power gets from the input to the output in first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. All right, when you're looking at a pilot bearing, and that's the little bearing that's right in the center of the crankshaft or the flywheel. Look for smooth rotation, you feel that way. You're usually going to get one of those with a clutch. You've seen those in the clutch box and all that. Damage to the tip of the transmission input shaft from bearing seizure. The older ones would have a centered bronze bearing, I mean bushing in there, and you'd actually get it out of there by... I've got a thing that screws in there real tight. It's really got a strong taper on it. When you screw it into that bushing, and I'm not talking about little bearings, that's a different tool, you would actually pump that thing up with grease. And the more grease you pump in there, the hydraulics of that grease would push that thing out. Then you just bump another one in there. Uh, you got, when you're looking at the pressure plate, which is this big heavy part right here, you're going to look for run out, hot spots, heat crack, damage diaphragm, coil springs, pivot arms, all that stuff. Look at it real close. You're going to replace it anyway. Flywheel inspection, you know. I've never seen anybody do this test on any vehicle I've ever, any, any shop I've ever worked at. Never seen it. But you know what? Uh, this guy, Mike Moore over here, he's always up for a challenge. And he resurfaces flywheels on his disc lathe, his, his disc brake lathe. He built some adapters and put it on there so he could resurface flywheels on that thing. Does a beautiful job of it, too. And it's just an old Amco lathe. Run out, hot spots, heat cracks. You know, like what are you gonna, that's a, the flywheel, some flywheel ring gear damage. Have, has anybody seen a flywheel damage lately? Yeah, have you seen them? Seven teeth missing off the one on the Eldorado. Uh, inspecting the cable. You got, some of them got a cable with self adjuster linkage on them. And that's something you're going to have to deal with. It's not really that hard to work on. Damaged quadrant teeth up in there. You got a little uh, thing up inside the car that automatically adjusts the clutch cable. Look at the front. And I tell you, the most common thing I've done on some of the older Mustangs and haven't replaced the double clutch cable, I've replaced them in parking lots because the thing would be out there. I'd have to lay on there and feed them through there and hook that clutch cable up to both ends because the clutch cable will break. When you're replacing a the clutch, there's some procedures that ought to be followed. Always replace a clutch disc and presser plate as a set. Never get oil or grease on the clutch disc friction linings. If you put too much grease in your pilot bearing or bushing and it's going to splay out and get on there, you're going to have chatter and you're going to stuff like that. Machine surface of the flywheel and excessive wear or damage is apparent or replace the flywheel. After machining it, check its specifications, and there's some normal wear. Got pictures now, y'all. We're not quite so bored when we have some pictures. This is normal wear of a clutch disc. Got it? That's normal wear. There will be a pop test on this, so keep your eye open. Shattering clutch. You see what's wrong here? Do you see what's wrong in this picture? Anybody see what's wrong in that picture? This strap is bent. That strap is not supposed to be bent like that. See the strap on this one? See these straps? That's what you're looking at, those straps. See how it was not bent? This other one is. 
Excessive vehicle load, high speed downshifting, lugging the engine. Anybody in here ever do any high speed downshifting? Um, no. Mm. Oh, I've heard if you lose your brakes on a stick shift, the best way to do it is just downshift at whatever speed you're at. And That's right. Come to a stop. Yeah, and it, hopefully that won't happen if you're going 142 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah. Chattering clutch due to bent disc. See the bent disc? I was talking about the bent disc while ago. This is a picture. This is what that's talking about. Got it? All right. Burst friction material. Harsh downshifting, high RPM engagement, over revving, coasting at high speed with a clutch engaging in gear. Got it? That's just really a nasty mess there, isn't it? Yeah. There was a big truck that we had whenever I was working at that offshore services company down in Texas. And it was a low store 1850, had big gas burning engine in it. It had a five speed transmission, and it was a little short drive shaft coming out of the back of that transmission, and it went through another transmission that was a four speed. It was an auxiliary transmission. So you had a gear shifter here and a gear shifter here. Now you didn't want to shift them both all the time, but if you wanted to do some heavy duty pulling, if you put this, this one back here in the lowest gear, and the one in front of it in the lowest gear, and with your engines revving really high, you were going like two miles an hour. I mean, but boy, did you ever have some power. You could move anything off. Well, these guys kept using the, the highest gear and doing crazy stuff and burning the clutch out on this stupid truck. And that transmission was a monster. It was like gigantic. And I'd have to pull it out with a jack laying under there on the creeper and all that kind of stuff. I says, can we get a clutch that won't burn up so fast on this thing? And he said, well, we can get you, build you one of these brass button clutches you know, with brass buttons on it instead of having this. And you know what they did with that? It came apart, and the next thing I pulled it apart, they had busted this in four pieces and destroyed the flywheel. <laughs> so I just couldn't win on that one. You know, it was a booger. And the boss man came by one day when I was pulling that thing out, and he goes, how much do you lack? And I said, I don't lack none of it, Mr. Wayne, but i got to do it all. You know? All right, here we got friction material, flywheel, rough, not surfaced properly. If it, if it chews that up, you know, if you got a roughly surfaced flywheel that uh, is not right. Now look at these pressure plate heat rings. See how it's been getting hot right there? All contamination, failure to resurface, stepped or cut flywheel, like if the flywheel is not uh, flat, you know. Now there's your broke clutch cable. If it's kinked or broke, you're not going to have a one to work around. Look at that. Broken torsion damper. That's them springs are all busted out of there. You see there? High RPM engagement. Abusing the torsion damper, causing the springs to fracture. I mean, that's when you're really tearing that thing up. You got it? That's the people that spend $5,000 building their engine and they blow it up the first week down at Holt and then they go build another one. You see them do the kind of thing? Look at this one here, a broken hub. What do you think about that? What do you think that cause that? End of slideshow. Oh, that's what we like. We like to see that last slide, don't we? Okay. Now then, open up this manual transmission test one. You got that one? Okay. The rotating force created by an engine is called what? Torque. Torque. That ain't complicated, is it? Nope. All right. Rotating force caused. All right. Now then, which of the following transmissions? Uh, oh, let transmissions multiply engine torque. Gear ratio. <laughs> okay, so the rate of speed that work is done is called what? Power. Would it be power flow, differential action, torque, or power? It has to be power. Wouldn't it? The path power takes from the engine to the wheels is what? Power flow. Is it power flow? Does that sound good to y'all? Yep. All right. Now we got a little forward uh, part matching thing. What provides differential action on front wheel drive vehicles? What, what are we talking about when we say differential action? Anybody know? This. Differential action. Why do you need differential action? What's the purpose of these little gears in here? Ring gears here. These are your axles going out. Why do you need those little gears in there? Why can't you just run it straight out? Because when you go around a curve, the inside wheel doesn't turn as fast as the outside wheel, and you, they need to be allowed to do that. That's what this differential is. So where is the differential located in a front wheel drive vehicle? Well, it's actually between the two half shafts in the manual transaxle. You got me? All right. Transfers power to, what transfers power to the front wheels on front wheel drive vehicles? 
Half shaft, there you go. Half shaft. Yeah. What is it that multiplies torque on rear wheel drive vehicles? And what couples and uncouples the engine from the transmission? The clutch. That is just really not complicated at all, is it? Nope. All right. That winds us up on that.